Good morning and welcome to worship with the community of First United Methodist Church of Austin, where we believe that every person is a beloved child of God on a journey to God with God. I'm Taylor First, the senior pastor. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm so delighted that you're joining us for worship today. As I offer a few announcements, I want to invite you to uh, greet others in the chat or in the um, comment section, where, in whichever way that you're watching today and participating in worship. Greet those because there is a community gathered today for worship. We're glad you're here. I want to invite you to take a moment and to uh, fill out the connections card that you can find online on our website. You can uh, find that in the e-news that came out uh, this morning and uh, click on that and make sure that you let us know that you're worshiping with us. If you're a guest and, uh, and not a regular part of our congregation, I especially in invite you to uh, reach out and let us know that you're joining us. We're really glad that you're here. A couple of announcements. First, as you um, probably already know, fathers are kind of hard to shop for sometimes. And so if you are looking for a last minute Father's Day gift, we've got alternative Father's Day gifts that will bless someone else. Um, and so we invite you to uh, take a look and shop for those Father's Day gifts that will um, be an opportunity to, um, to be a blessing to somebody else today. You should have been receiving emails from Barnabas, who serves as our staff encourager. This summer, Barnabas's role is expanding to a congregation-wide encourager, and so he will be sending emails throughout the summer, but only if you sign up for them. So I invite you to make sure that you uh, go through our website and sign up to receive those weekly notes of encouragement from Barnabas, as well as... Um, some suggestions for ways that you can be engaging with this series on the parables. Make sure to sign up for that today. Then I want to make you aware of a couple of um, learning opportunities that are before us this summer. First, going along with our parables study, Brad King and Laura Green are teaching a, uh, a study on some of the other parables that we are not covering in the sermon series. And so um, this is a great way to get to know more of Jesus's teaching um, through their, their teaching and their creative engagement with those parables. Also, uh, Dr. Walter Brueggemann, who is a, a renowned Old Testament scholar, um, has written a book called Virus as a Summons to Faith, in which he is drawing together the Christian faith and theology with this experience of a worldwide pandemic and helping us to make sense of that as Christians. Reverend John McMullen, our former senior pastor, is leading a book study on that book and would love to have you join with that. That's being done through Zoom, and so we invite you to sign up for that as well. All right, friends, now as we enter into worship, let's join in our response. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Join me in our call to worship. The Lord is the good shepherd who supplies our every need. The Lord is our shepherd who cares for all. The Lord is the good shepherd who gives us strength for the journey. The Lord is our shepherd who grants us rest and restores our souls. Praise and thanks be to the Lord. We lift up our hearts to God today. Thank <laughs> you. 
join your hearts with mine in prayer. Loving shepherd, you know the name of every person who gathers to worship this morning. You know the heart of each person who faces persecution or neglect today. You walk beside every one who struggles to find their way. And you carry every cherished one who can no longer walk on their own. We open our hearts to you today. Help us to follow in your gentle yet revolutionary way. Lead us toward paths that end in righteousness, justice, and a world made whole. Amen. As I said before, each week we are inviting you to find creative ways to engage in that week's parable. And so we want to share with you now some of the ways that our congregation has been engaging this week with last week's parable of the sower. Take a look at this video. There are moments before we know, before we recognize what we see, before we understand, the moment letters are not yet words, becoming ideas, becoming meaning, becoming change, and then slowly or suddenly, and after when we cannot unknow, that moment the seeds continually cast, now opening, breaking into light and air and rising, rising together through what seemed untended ground, made ready by quiet work beneath our sight, completed so we may eventually be able to comprehend like words, becoming ideas, becoming meaning, becoming change, everything we might be able to reap. Before we join in our prayer for illumination, let me just say uh, a word of excitement that we have uh, Reverend Brad First, who is my husband and the one person that I don't have to social distance from as our preacher today. And so I know that you'll be blessed and I am particularly excited that he is here to bring the word today. Join me in our prayer for illumination. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers." Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. 
For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, First Church. My name is Pastor Brad First, and I am the Lutheran campus pastor serving the University of Texas. Um, and our community is called Lumen Austin. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm glad to be with you this morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Leave it to religious authorities to ruin a perfectly good healing. Immediately preceding this gospel reading from John, a once unclean, socially distanced blind man receives his sight. And no sooner is he now eligible for communal synagogue life together than some Pharisees reign on his parade. They explain away the sign before them as fake news. So Jesus calls out their blindness. It's this whole episode that provokes Jesus to wax pastoral. He's the gate for the sheep. He's the good shepherd. Jesus uses figure of speech with these Pharisees to help open their eyes. Unfortunately, his good shepherd preaching leaves them just as baffled and divided as before. First Church, last Sunday, your religious leaders launched all y'all into a summer series focusing on parables a genre of storytelling oft used by Jesus to be cast alongside the lives of his hearers for the purpose of instruction, for understanding God's reign, for guidance and sustaining faith in Christ. And while Jesus isn't so much telling a parable here as using a figure of speech, it's difficult for us not to hear it as such. There's no more image, I think, more cherished by the church than that of Christ, the good shepherd. We yearn for this image of our Savior, King, and Messiah to be cast alongside our everyday lives. Christ, the good shepherd, gets invoked at our funerals, in our Sunday school classes, on Facebook memes, and on our stained glass windows. We have much affection for this image of Jesus as the good shepherd, quite in spite of the fact that the vast majority of us are far removed from shepherding life, not to mention the socio-political loadedness behind what Jesus is saying when he says not once, but twice, I am the good shepherd. My Methodist siblings, you know how you'll hear someone make a claim or assertion that is clearly fault flawed, and you think to yourself, or in my case, accidentally say aloud, I don't think that means what he thinks it means. <laughs> I wonder if the same can be said for the church who waxes sentimental with Christ the Good Shepherd. Recall, once Jesus wraps up his I am the shepherd speech, his original audience was divided because of his words. Some dismissed him as having a demon and out of his mind, whilst others weighed the import of this rabbi's Good Shepherd claim. Truth be told, it's a bit, bit disturbing to know that by Jesus describing himself as the good shepherd. He borrowed a title from the propaganda machine of the empire. It was common in the Greco-Roman world for kings and emperors to be described as good shepherds. A good emperor of the day was thought to keep borders secure against enemies he was thought to ensure the food supply was sustainable and reliable, and he ensured a relative freedom for the population just as long as you, dear citizen, behaved. All of that, of course, wasn't really happening in Jesus' day, just as it isn't, doesn't happen in any day under the rule of autocrats. 
During New Testament times, 70 to 80 percent of the population were food insecure. The Roman and priestly systems operated for the benefit of those at the top. A practice put on notice by the earlier Hebrew prophets. And don't get me started on the healthcare system. Does Jesus really mean to borrow a title from imperial propaganda to describe himself? Then, too, when you get down to the nitty gritty work of shepherding, it's anything but sentimental. Let me be the pastor first to tell you. I remember a, a time back during my uh, group work camp emceeing days. Yeah, so this one time at work camp in Navajo Mountain, Utah, I had the opportunity to go out with the camp photographer to take pictures of campers working on people's homes when we arrived at a work site that had sheep. And wouldn't it be cute for the camp MC to strike his best good shepherd pose with one of those little lambs? You know the meme. The one where the good shepherd is cradling a lamb in his arms. Yeah, I struck that pose. I also had the one taken of the sheep slung over my shoulders. <laughs> Poor cute little lamb never saw it coming. Of course, neither did I. Because when the camp photographer and I got back into the car, that photographer turned, looked at me with a goodly amount of disgust and said, my Lord, what is that smell? Shepherding sheep is messy business. Sheep aren't all that bright. They get themselves into all kinds of trouble. Their wool is scratchy. And they have a certain odor about them. Trust me on this. Indeed, I don't think what Jesus means by calling himself the good shepherd is what we, his would-be sheep, commonly think it means. Begging the question, why on earth, Jesus, are you calling yourself the good shepherd? Are you out of your mind? Tucked within Jesus' good shepherdness is the assurance that he will always be about the business of calling out his sheep who know his voice when they hear it. He's the one who tends us. He's the one who, with rod and staff in hand, unlike the autocrats, comforts the afflicted and afflicts all the all too comfortable. Christ, our good shepherd, is not like any king, emperor, or would-be autocrat in that the life he promises isn't one that keeps the powerful in power and the underlings under. Life in Christ's fold promises abundance for all. For all. One that's not so much in accord with a my best life now heresy, but an abundant life that seeks justice, loves kindness, and is led humbly by our shepherding God. What's more, this life, this, this abundant life, is not just for a kind of frozen sectarian, frozen fold. Oh, contraire, mon fuzzy frères. This shepherd has sheep besides all y'all. Sheep of all kinds, black ones, whose lives matter as much as him, to him as white ones. Undocumented sheep who know his loving voice every bit as well and some, perhaps better than some documented ones. Jesus has sheep mowed over by the church in his loving arms. Ones with shipwrecked faith are slung over his shoulder. Ones with no faith at all are being tended by him. What makes Jesus' Jesus is shepherding, shepherding just that good is how he's not so much about the tidy business of securing borders so much as he's about gathering the insecure within his wide, wide border, one that knows no bounds. This past semester, I've been reading with our campus ministry students a book by Pastor Lenny Duncan entitled Dear Church, a love letter from a black preacher 
to the widest denomination in the U.S. That would be my denomination. In it, Pastor Duncan writes about Jesus' way of shepherding. At its core, and at its core, it's subversive. In this world of wayward, autocratic shepherding, quote, radical evil wants complacency, not subversion. It wants us all comfortable, unchallenged, and staring at the stained glass windows of our church from the inside, while someone who is suffering is staring at those same windows from the outside. Friends, it's for the salvation of this insider, outsider, us and them, scattering, snatching, an abandoned world that this Christ, our good shepherd, lays down his life. That by having it taken up again, his subversive, all-inclusive, all-embracing love would win the day. This day that the Lord has made here, now, and forevermore. I realize there are many tuned in. One second. Technology. I realize there are many tuned in who might be struggling to see this good shepherd's love on the loose. It's understandable how we can become blinded by a pandemic on the loose, a criminal injustice system, brutality from those who are supposed to protect and serve, and a hateful tweeter verse. The good news is that Christ, our light and life, refuses to leave us alone in our blindness and doubt. Out of his sheer unwavering love, his voice calls, his rod and his staff, they tend and comfort. Even now he calls you to lay back, recline, rest in the green grass, be gathered at the table, be fed, be anointed, be assured. You have a good shepherd, the one and only good shepherd, through whom, with whom, in whom, you're being gathered by the Spirit to have abundant life, to love and to be loved abundantly. Amen. During these next few minutes, we take time to gather up our uh, prayer requests that we long to offer to God. So as the music plays, I invite you to think of those whom you are praying for, for yourself, for others you know, for our world that is hurting so deeply. If you wish, you may um, type those into the comments or into the chat as you watch or simply sit and reflect on those as we prepare to offer our prayers to God.
As we pray, please join me in our response. I will say, we your people and the sheep of your pasture, pasture, and then we'll say together, we'll give thanks to you forever. Let us pray. God of sheep and shepherds, as we look around, these pastures are not green. The waters right now are turbulent and salty. Come near to us in our time of need. Make straight our paths and restore our souls. We hear you calling, Lord. We, your people, and the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. Shepherding God, your flock is anxious and scattered by the wolves. Wolves of coronavirus and economic uncertainty of racism, and of violence. We need your calming presence. We need you to bind our wounds and pour your healing ointment on our heads. We need the briars and brambles and burrs pulled from our fleece and skin. But though we struggle, Lord, we know you struggle with us. We, your people, and the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Hear your flock cry out for justice. Lead us to words that will crack open hearts and feed us with the courage that makes righteousness known. Protect us from hired hands that do not care for us, that have neglected and abused us in the past. Guide us with your voice and give us ears to hear. We, your people, and the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. God of sheep and shepherds, we are the people of your pasture and the sheep of your hand. We give thanks for your love and patience and care. We give thanks for your calming presence and your loving touch. When anxiety and fear scatter your flock, remind us that whatever we face, we face together. Help us to trust you even when the path is treacherous. We, your people, and the sheep of your pasture will give thanks to you forever. We pray all of this in the name of Christ, who guided us and walked with us and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Good Shepherd invites all of us to take a step in following him and being his disciple. So I invite you to consider how will you respond? What will be the the step of faith that you take in this coming week? How will you uh, take a stand as a follower of Christ for justice? How will you reach out in mercy? How will you draw deeper in love with God? I invite you to consider your response for this week. Part of how we respond is by learning to give our lives away just as the shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We learn to do that by uh, giving ourselves and giving our things away. So um, we invite you to give freely and generously to support the ministry of the church, but even more to be a part of all that God is doing in the, in this world. Join me, um, join your hearts with mine in our prayer of dedication as we prepare to make our offering today. Spirit of liberation, you soften the places within us that have become hardened by pain. You melt what has been frozen by fear In whatever ways we have learned to protect ourselves by turning on our neighbors, forgive us, O God. 
May these offerings be a sign of our renewed commitment to live differently, to love boldly, and to create the world anew. Amen. Our closing hymn is We Are Called. It is an invitation to come, to live in the light, to open our hearts, to sing a new song, and then a chance to remind ourselves of the life that we are called to live as followers of this Good Shepherd. Would you join me in singing We Are Called?
I pray that you will be blessed in the week to come, and I invite you to join together now in blessing one another with our benediction. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.